Hi, everyone. Uh, we're getting started. And so uh, this is the third and the last Atlas winner sessions uh, in this conference. Uh, we have Jennifer Robinette here from Mass College. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Robinette is an assistant professor of communications and public relations at Mass College. She has been teaching college communication classes since 94 and teaching online since 2010. She's a quality matter trained and a quality matter peer reviewer. She has built a award winning course and project sites and served as a judge for the Marist College Teaching with Island Innovation Awards. Dr. Robinette earned her master's degree in communication from Marshall University in 96 and her PhD in communication and information studies from the University of Kentucky in 2011. Her dissertation is on understanding interactive experiences. Her award-winning course, Introduction to Communication, is a purely online course. It's a virtual threshold to the communication major at Mass College. Um, let's hear from Jennifer herself about this okay. course. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Louisa. Um, I appreciate it, and thank you for honoring my class with the award. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity for all of us to be able to see what other people are doing and get great ideas um, for new and exciting things to do in our classes. So I think these awards are very beneficial. All right. So welcome to your Introduction to Communication online class. And now let's talk about theory, right? I can hear the snores of students around the world as soon as I mention the word theory in any shape or form. Um, so how do you bring theory to life? The introduction to communication class, one of the main things it's supposed to do is give them a theoretical foundation for the rest of their classes for the majors um, and minors in the communication department. So it's a huge uh, challenge. This particular class is a three credit hour fully online class. Um, it is also taught in the classroom. So the challenge is how do we create experiences for our students that are um, at least equivalent to what the um, classroom students are experiencing? And then how do we build communication theory knowledge that sticks, which is a problem both in the classroom courses and online? My goal, though, for this class was to create interactive experiences that would be unrivaled in the classroom. So um, this, I wanted this to be a unique experience. I took the class on and just revamped the whole thing and um, made it into something I thought would you know, be exciting for students and engaging for students. So we have both traditional and non-traditional students in the class. And it is a requirement for communication majors and minors, but it's an elective for many other um, majors at Marist. We have about 25 to 30 students per class, and so far I've taught this new and improved version of the class during three different um, terms. Uh, a summer term that was 11 weeks, and then condensed that to four weeks, and then expanded it again for eight weeks. Uh, so, and I'm teaching it again this summer. Taught it a few times already. I use the lessons tool as the central hub for most of the learning activities in the class. And my dissertation research was on interactivity and understanding interactive experiences. And one of the things that came out of my experiment was that responsiveness and control are two really important aspects of an interactive experience. How quickly do students get what they need when they click on something, and do they get the right thing? Um, so if they click on something looking for a particular resource and they get something they didn't expect, uh, then it takes away from the feeling of interactivity. If they click on a page and it takes a long time to load, that detracts from the feeling of interactivity. So I use um, tools that I've been introduced to by Louisa and all my friends in academic technology, Dee Dee included, um, to get the pages to load more quickly, like the sections, the collapsible sections, cr critical if you're going to have videos on a page to get it to load more quickly. And also the sections help you more easily understand what's there and be able to navigate the site. I use checklists extensively, and I'm going to show you examples of that. I use um, sub, sub pages and along with the sections, and I use the prerequisites tool quite a bit. 
comments and text tools, I combine those to create the class Q&A page, as well as um, activity pages. Instead of using the form specifically, I kind of do it in a different way. So I'll show you how to do that. Also, link to reflective uh, critical thinking, online activities, and I use the test and quizzes tool in a way that might be unique that I'm going to show you in a little bit. I use it to create forms for things like a student profile and to enter their activity results. So basically, we're going to talk about using iLearn tools to guide, engage, and support our online students. And I'd like for you to think about the examples that I'm going to show you of what I've done and things that you've seen or maybe that you've done in your classes. And at the end, maybe we can brainstorm even more ways. I'm always looking for better ways to do things um, to guide, engage, and support our online students. So first, guiding them. The first thing that students have to do in the course is they complete an orientation. And the first thing they'll see is their orientation checklist. So this is helpful for them to keep track of the things that they've accomplished and what still needs to be done, because there are quite a few steps involved. They have to build their profile. Um, being an intro course, it's an intro to communication course, most of them possibly have not been in iLearn a lot. They haven't you know, uploaded their photo, established their profile. They haven't um, spent a lot of time doing those things. And it really makes a difference when they have posts and when they log on and they see their own face. And, you, and when I can see them as a professor, it makes a huge difference. So they have to upload their photo um, and then complete a student profile that I'm going to show you in a little bit. And then a syllabus quiz and a pretest. And then I have them forward all of their messages from iLearn to their email accounts so that I can be sure that they're getting the messages. All right. So here's an example of the prerequisites and the collapsible sections on the orientation page. And so you can see I've got step by step there. And those sections will all collapse um, so that once they've completed it, they can close it. That's handy as well. The tests and quizzes tool. So here's the, the student profile. This is part of collecting information to help us guide students. So I use the fill in the blank tool um, in the tests and quizzes to have them enter their major and their minor. And this is going to create, I'm a, I also teach research, uh, applied research and analytics, so I'm a data person. So this will also create data that I'll use in my classes extensively. And then why are they taking the class? I like to use the matrix. Um, feature in tests and quizzes for these things because it is the only type of question that I'm aware of that um, will automatically score it. It will automatically give the points. Once they've completed you know, the yes or no's on that, they'll get the, the point, and I don't have to actually manually adjust that. So, And it's also handy the way that it comes out in the data. Um, all right, and then I can have a list of all the different communication courses and ask them, have they taken them prior, or have they are they taking it concurrently? And if they haven't done either, they just leave it blank. This also helps uh, when analyzing the data. It's a little bit neater to analyze. because You can download it as an Excel file. I ask them, are they in the honors program? Do they need accommodations? If yes, then they can describe the accommodations that they need right underneath there in the comment box. So as soon as the student profiles are all completed, I go in, I look at the data, and I create um, a special group for students who require accommodations because they get extended times for tests. So that helps me make sure that everyone's in the, the place that they belong. I have a quizzes um, group, and then I have an accommodations group. And the accommodations people, um, of course, get a number of different things, especially extended time. All right, I can also ask them about their online accounts and the technology that they use. Again, collecting data to sort of track um, the students over time, but then also um, to find out what can I use, what other sorts of things can I incorporate into the class, because they're already using it. And then the experience scales. I love using the matrix um, feature in the tests and quizzes to create scales. Likert scales, and um, this is a good way to estimate the level of experience they think they have with online classes, iLearn, and things like Trello that I was introduced to by my friends in academic technology, um, and SurveyMonkey, Second Life, all the different things that I might want to include in an activity. All right, so in 
in the main chapter by chapter section, you have the chapter textbook and each chapter is set out in its own little section. And you have a checklist at the top because not every single chapter has an activity associated with it. So that students can keep track of what they've completed, they have that checklist at the top. A student had posted in the Q&A forum on the Q&A page about having difficulty finding the study guides. They were posted on the quizzes page, but I thought, why not have a section right on the chapter by chapter page where she might be looking for information. So I also now embed them in a section on the chapter by chapter page. This is an example of a single chapter page, and you can see that there's a checklist at the top of every chapter, big fan of the checklist. Um, and then um, you have different sections. So you have the activity section so that it stands out. It's a different color so that it stands out. You have the chapter notes section, which when they click on the image of the title slide, then that brings up the PDF of the chapter notes. And then there are the videos. And super important that those are in a collapsible section so that the, the page loads very quickly. And when they're ready to view the videos, they can click on that section, it will um, expand it, and then um, it usually works a lot better that way. All right, the quizzes page. So prerequisites and collapsible sections, again, help create something that's easier for them to understand. Once they've dealt with chapter one, they can collapse that, they don't have to see it anymore, and they can expand chapter or quiz number two and all of the study guide and details for that. And then the debriefing. So we have the orientation at the beginning of the class, we have the debriefing at the end of the class. You've got the checklist for that. They write a letter to future students, which I get great feedback from, uh, much better than the um, evaluations that we get. This is much more detailed. So I had, can collect all sorts of great you know, quotes and ideas from the letter to future students. That's the first step, and it's a prerequisite, and it's a collapsible section. And then they have a post-test study guide, and then they have the post-test section itself. So that they don't overlook the post-test study guide, that's a step in and of itself. Because they only get the points they earn on that. On the pre-test, they get points just for taking it. But on the post-test, it's, it's you know, only performance-based. All right, so again, those prerequisites and the collapsible sections helping to keep them and guide them along the way as they finish their course debriefing. So now engaging online students. This is very, this is the fun part, right? Where we try to um, design experiences for them. And the first way that I engage them is during the course orientation when they introduce themselves. So the final step in the orientation is where they go on and they post a little something about themselves, introduce themselves to their classmates and to me. Then for the chapters, they do things like they'll log on and go into the perception activity. There are two videos that you've probably seen sometime in your academic career about selective attention. There's one with a gorilla, one with a woman with an umbrella walking through, and they're supposed to count the number of times the basketballs are passed, right? So, which is sort of the distractor activity to see if they notice these very prominent things um, in these videos. So they watch each of the videos, and then they go and post about their experience. And other students get to see, hey, not everyone saw the gorilla, or not everyone saw the woman with the umbrella, and they understand that perception can be very, very different. You can be looking at exactly the same thing and see totally different things. So I use the comments tool for them to post because they're all right there on the same page and it makes a nice um, one page layout there for everyone. Here are just, it's a sort of a mashup of the different activities that they do um, in the class as well. There's a cultural dimensions activity, which I love. They can go and choose a culture that is different from their own. So they choose their own culture and then one that they want to learn more about. And they get to compare them side by side on all the different dimensions of intercultural communication. So, um, you know, power distance and um, sense of time, all of those things that can be different from culture to culture, they get to see that side by side and the differences there. The mind and the eyes activity is another one of my favorites because they get to go test their nonverbal reading skills, basically. They, they only see people's eyes and they have to choose the emotion that the person is having. And then they get their score at the end and then they have to reflect on, you know, 
were they surprised by their score or not. So that's a, a useful interactive activity as well. But the hands down favorite tends to be the Johari window activity. And I love this one too because it solicits uh, feedback from their friends and family. And it helps them learn more about themselves and become more self-aware. So they log on and they'll get into the chapter activity for the Johari window activity and they'll learn a little bit about it and then they go click on the link and they set up their Johari window. So the first thing they do is they choose five or six traits that they think describe themselves best. And they'll get a link, a specific link that they will then send to their friends and family members. This is their initial profile that's just based on what they see in themselves. They send the link to four plus friends or family members and then those four plus friends or family members choose the traits that they think the person possesses. And when they get it back, they have a complete Johari window and they can see their blind spot, the qualities that were prominent to other people that they didn't see in themselves. Um, the unknown spot, which is um, the, the spot where neither, they're not aware of it and they don't show it to other people either. Their facade, which is what they show to other people, but um, they themselves feel that they're different. And then the arena, that's their public, their, their public face. Um, so the, and then they get a breakdown of like all the percentages that, of the responses and their most dominant traits. Now after they get that back, they can put all of that in a Word document and they go to the tests and quizzes link and they enter their activity results. So I use the um, fill in the blanks to create the lists, and they can list their top five dominant traits. They can tell me, you know, who did you send the link to? And then um, I'll use an essay question to get them to reflect on were they surprised by the traits that others saw in them. Another part of the same Johari window activity form is I embed the, the Johari window image right in the text question and then ask them if they were surprised by their dominant window because they'll have a dominant window as well. And then I use the matrix and a comment um, box to ask them if, uh, if they self-disclose or not. Yes, no, or it's complicated are their three choices. And then they can describe it in the box below. And then the last thing they do is upload that Word document that has all of the information in it from their activity. All right, so supporting online students, that can be a huge challenge, right? Because we don't get to see them face to face, um, or at least in the traditional sense, we can see them on Skype and other um, Google Hangouts, those types of resources. But I created a, a Q&A den where the Marist Red Fox is. So it's a Q&A den, and of course I'm using my, my beloved collapsible sections and to have everything appear on one page instead of using um, forums or subpages. So they're collapsible sections, and then I have them post comments in the collapsible sections. So I add the comments tool to the collapsible sections, and then I will convert the comments to text so that they'll be there when I build this class again. They'll be permanent, right? So um, I'll continue to convert the questions. But initially, they're posting comments in the collapsible section first, and then I, I make them a permanent feature in the text. Also, I have a link to help with APA style on the menu, and then um, help with troubleshooting iLearn collapsible sections again. I have step-by-step -step procedures, and you wouldn't believe how much this is cut down on the emails that you get for help from students because now you're helping them learn to troubleshoot. So, you know, the basic first steps of troubleshooting, um, you know, log out of your browser, um, and the log back in, you know, bring it, try a different browser, those types of things that are basic troubleshooting steps. So it walks them through that. And then they can also um, schedule an appointment with me, and this is a feature that's nice where it's a link on the menu, but it embeds it directly into iLearn. So they can click on the menu item and then schedule an appointment with me. They don't have to, of course, be able to come in and see me face to face. We can use Skype or Google Hangouts to meet, but they can do that right from within the course. All right, so what thoughts, comments, 
uh, ideas, questions do you have about how we can guide, engage, and support online students even better in the future? Have you seen anything that is best practices for these three goals? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, hi, yes. Mm -hmm. Just uh, what I noticed most was the breakdown of accommodations for students. Just start having that be as a starting point, especially even for online students who can then self-identify. Yes. Um, and having that broken down in the first few days of the class is one way to really jumpstart an engagement. I thought that was rather brilliant. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have seen one example. Uh, they set up a forum and let a student express their fears. You know, uh, because when you have a theory class, a lot of students are scared. Uh, so we set up forums yeah. and say, hey, everybody is afraid of something, right? Yeah. So build up this community of support and oh. talk about your fears at the very beginning, so get the, that over with. So I wonder if that would be most effective, and I've wondered about this as well with the comments. Um, anonymous or not anonymous? Because you can make them anonymous. I don't know. I mean, if you're talking about something as intimate as fears, for instance, if I wanted them to post anything about, for each other, about their Johari window activity, I would probably consider making those comments anonymous because you know, I don't want them to feel like they have to expose themselves in the class too much. Um, after all, the whole activity is about self-disclosure, and not everyone is comfortable with that, right? So, um, so that's an interesting question. It would enable you to, to let them discuss things that might be um, more personal in nature. <laughs> um, hi, I was just wondering, um what the student population is? Are they undergrads? Are they uh, adult learners? Uh, we have an adult program, yes. And the student population at Maris is about 6,000. Um, and five to 6,000, I think, total. Yeah. And so um, the, the adults, it's a small group right now, and it's growing. It's called the School of Professional Programs handles that. And um, do you have a way that they can um, meet like, because it's, it's completely online, but do you have a way that they can meet in se separate groups and, like, form their own study groups? Ooh, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Um, to Yes, you could do that. You could set up uh, meeting spaces for them for each and, and have them in different groups if they wanted to form groups based on whether they were traditional or non-traditional. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, because um, I know uh, a lot of the non-traditional students might um, be busy during the day, and yep. if they needed to uh, do study groups, they wouldn't, um, like, at, they'd have to meet at night, or, or it would be more difficult for them to, uh, to, to maybe uh, meet together or, or form a group. Sure, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's interesting that you mentioned that, because this class, at one point, when I first started teaching it, they actually had two different sections. One for non-traditional students was, had a different section number than the traditional students. Um, they didn't see that with each other, but there were actually students from two different sections enrolled in the same class in iLearn. And I think they, they're not doing that anymore, I don't think, I don't know. It didn't happen this summer the same way. So, but to, to help have them, help facilitate that communication in a way that would best suit their lifestyle and their needs, that's a really important consideration. Yeah, good idea. I'm building it for this summer. I'll incorporate that for sure. See. Ya. I don't remember the exact situation, but um, I, when you were talking earlier about the different groups for accommodations, students and students without accommodations, one of the things that some of my colleagues were talking about earlier this past semester was that in some cases the the group names were showing up and oh. so we have to be really careful to not just call it accommodations or something right. that's going to self-identify 
So I just wanted to share that. Right. I, I wish I could remember the specific about why. Messages tool. The messages tool. So they can send right. Yeah. Yes, that's right. You know you can hide those. You can hide different groups that you don't want them to be able to, if you want, like if you don't want them to see that as a specific group. You, I, at least I have done that. Because, um, no, no, but I mean, they wouldn't be able to email like the accommodations group of students. I can take that out of the, the list of people they could email. I have done that before. Um, when I create groups that I, I only want to see, basically. For instance, I also have a group that's called unavailable. So my group is unavailable. There's no one in it, including me, so that if I'm working on a feature, I set it to be available only to the group unavailable, and I take that out of the message options, right? So that, <laughs> yeah. Just to kind of, that way I don't have to delete things. I can just have it not show up. All right, any other ideas? Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you.